Very subject lesson. She says, there are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit, and they hope by this to become Christians. They hope to be revived. But you see, the problem is, reformation will not bring revival. No matter how much we try to do the right thing, it will not bring revival. But true revival will bring reformation. Amen? She goes on to say in Christ's Object Lessons, page 97, that they hope by this to become Christians, but they are beginning in the wrong place. She says, our first work is with the heart. Amen? Our first work is with the heart. If we're not beginning with the heart, we are beginning in the wrong place. We are cleansing everything in vain. It's like, let's put it this way. How many of you are parents? How many of you do the housework? Mopping and sweeping and everything else. Now imagine you just finished mopping the floor. It's spotless. It's nice. You have company coming over Sabbath morning. It's Friday evening. Just before sunset and you get everything looking nice. That floor is spotless. You can see your reflection in it. And your little child's been out playing in the rain with muddy shoes and comes dashing across that kitchen floor and leaves mud everywhere. You go back and you mop, only for the child to run the other way and dirty it up again. That's exactly what we do when we try and clean the outside before the heart has become clean. Because we can reform for a temporary amount of time, but we're only going to be spotted and defiled again because the heart has not been changed. Amen? There needs to be a work of reformation and revival, but it begins with the heart. Amen? She says also in Christ's Object Lessons, page 315, paragraph 3. This statement is very interesting. She says, many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists. Many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists. What is a moralist? Someone who stands for good morals, right? She says, many who call themselves Christians are nothing more than human moralists. They stand for good morals, but the heart has not yet been changed. You see, I know many atheists who are good moralists. But what makes the difference between them and a Christian? A Christian understands that the first work begins here. We must have Christ abiding within. Amen? She says in Testimonies to the Church, volume 1, page 158. Testimonies to the Church, volume 1, page 158. Cleanse the fountain and the streams will be pure. If the heart is right, the words... Your words, your dress, your acts will all be right. Amen? Cleanse the fountain and the streams will be pure. If the heart is right, your words, your dress, your acts will all be right. Now, let me tell you something. God has given us health reform. God has given us dress reform. He has even given us Sabbath reform because as so-called Sabbath keepers, we still do not keep the Sabbath the way we should. As a matter of fact, we're told when a man keeps from the heart... The the, the fourth commandment, the seventh-day Sabbath, he will keep all other commandments perfectly. That tells me that we have not come to the point where we are keeping the Sabbath perfectly because we are still transgressing in other areas. When we perfectly keep the Sabbath, we will perfectly keep the whole law. We will be perfected in Christ. But we haven't reached that point yet. So the question is, what is it that we're not reaching? What is it that is not taking place? You see, we could preach... Message after message, we can hold event after event, but if we're starting at the wrong place, all of these things will be in vain. What is it that's going to win souls to the truth? It is when our hearts are converted and are reflecting the love of Christ. Amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Once again, we're going to Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Notice what the Word of God tells us here. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, 
except you be what? Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not end you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. At such a crucial time, notice what the disciples are still arguing about. Uh, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to sit at the right, right hand of Jesus? Who's going to be closest to his throne? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus doesn't even answer the question. He simply calls a child over to him and says, sit here. And he points to that innocent child and says, unless you're converted and become like this child, neither of you are going to be there in the first place. So I don't know why you're arguing about it. You need a heart conversion first and foremost. And if you had that, you wouldn't be arguing about this. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, looking at verse 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but what? But their heart is far from me. Is it possible to get Christianity down to a science where we can say the right thing at the right time, we can pray the right prayer, we can do all the right things, but for the wrong reasons? Can we do all of these things while the heart is still left untouched? Oh, yes. The Pharisees were masters at doing it. And Jesus said, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is still filthy. You clean the outside of the tomb, but the inside is full of dead man's bones. You see, we need to cleanse the inside, and reformation will follow as a result. Amen? We need a change of heart. Now, notice something with me. I'm going to ask that you turn with me to Luke chapter 22. We're going to Luke chapter 22. Beginning in verse 31. Notice what Jesus says. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Jesus is warning Peter. He's saying, Peter, Peter, Satan has asked for you by name. He wants to see what you're really made of. He knows that you claim to be my follower. He wants to see what you're really about. He's going to sift you. He's going to shake you up a little bit. How are you going to respond to it? You know Satan's calling each and every one of us by name? Because we will be sifted. We will be shaken. And if we do not have Christ abiding within, we will be shaken out. Satan wants to sift us like he sifted Peter. But notice Jesus' response in the next verse, verse 32. But, in other words, there's more to it than this, right? But... I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Even through the midst of the trial, we have a high priest who is praying for us. He is praying on our behalf that our faith will not fail us. I know some of us are going through trials right now. Amen? Amen. If you're not going through trials right now, you either just came out of one or you're about to enter one. Because trials are God's chosen method for refining the hearts and minds of his people. Amen? Refining the character of his people. So either you just came through a trial, either you're in the midst of a trial, or you're about to go through one. But let these words encourage us that when we go through trials, we have a high priest. And this is why it is so important for us as Seventh-day Adventists to understand our doctrine on the sanctuary. Amen? Those who do not understand the sanctuary doctrine will not have the faith they need to make it through the final crisis. We need to understand that we have a high priest. And yes, he is in the midst of the work of judgment, but judgment is given in favor of the saints. Amen? It is not something that we should fear if our lives are hidden with Christ. If you're not in Christ, then yeah, be afraid. Amen? <laughs> but if we're hiding in Christ, we have nothing to fear. Amen? Because judgment is given in our favor. Satan's stacking all the evidence against us, and Jesus points to the cross and says, what do you say about that? I died for him. Amen? It goes on to say in verse 32, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art what? And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Hold on a second. Jesus told Peter, when you are converted. Are you telling me that Peter was not converted at this point? 
All this time walking with Jesus, Peter still wasn't converted. But what did Peter believe in his heart? Do you think Peter believed that he was converted? You see, Jesus is looking at him and he even tells him, Peter, when you're converted. Now, if Jesus looked at me today and said, Justin, when you're converted, you'll win more souls to me. I'm going to be like, ouch, Lord, are you saying I'm not converted? (laughs) But Peter missed it. Notice what he says. Jesus tells him, when you were converted, strengthen thy brethren, verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both in prison and to death. His statement right there proved Jesus' words. You're not converted yet, Peter, because you're trying to stand in your own strength. You don't realize that you're going to fall without me. Amen? Verse 34. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day. Before thou shalt thrice deny me, deny that thou knowest me. You know, it wasn't until Jesus' words were fulfilled in the life of Peter that he realized how true those words were that Jesus had told him. He's like, this is what you was trying to tell me, Lord, I wasn't converted. And you know that experience cut Peter to the core. He never fully forgave himself for that. But praise God that we have a merciful Savior. Amen. Amen. Even through that experience, Jesus allowed him to fall to show him what was in his heart. But he says, hope is not lost. Come back. Come back to me. As a matter of fact, Jesus told him, because Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. He says, when you were converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter had to fall in order to realize his lack of Christ abiding in him. And then from that experience, he had a conversion experience. But it took that humbling, that falling, that That realization that, man, I'm nothing without Christ. I cannot stand on my own strength. You know, even after all this time of walking with Christ, Jesus could look at Peter and say, Peter, you're not yet converted. What would he say to some of us in the church today? If he truly looked at our lives, what would he tell us today? Some of us may have been in the church 30, 40, 50 years. Some of us were brought up in the church from birth. All we know is Adventists. We, we eat, breathe, sleep Adventism. We have Adventist logo stamped on our forehead. But Jesus looks and he says to Peter, just like he said to Peter, when you are converted, then you will win souls unto me. Amen? Let me share a quote with you. Some of you might not like this quote, but take it up with Alan White because I didn't write it. This is Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 370, paragraph 3. That's 6T, 370.3. She says, The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth. Wait a minute, what? The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth. Isn't the whole purpose of what God did on, on, in sending his son to die on the cross, isn't the whole purpose to win souls? Isn't the whole purpose to bring people into the truth? What do you mean God is not now working to bring many souls into the truth? Sounds like a contradictory statement, doesn't it? Why would God not work to bring many souls into the truth? This is the whole purpose of what he sent his son for. Notice. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of church members who have never been converted. Because of church members who have never been converted, we come to church week after week, we sit in the pews, but God has never really touched the heart. We've just learned to put on a good front, to put on a mask, to say happy Sabbath, to stay around for potluck and maybe share a couple of quotes, a couple of Bible verses. But Christ has not lived out his life in us yet. And because there are those who are in the church who have never been converted, and she goes on to say, and those who were once converted but have backslidden, this is why God does not now work to bring many souls into the truth. She says, what influence would these unconsecrated members have on new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God-given message that his people were to bear? Let me tell you something. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have a, a message that is unrivaled by any denomination. 
I don't say that to put down any other denomination. I don't say that privately. I say that to help us to realize our accountability to God because to whom much is given, much is required. Amen? And we have more light than any other denomination has on this planet. God has given us special insight. He has given us the most solemn messages to ever be given to the world in the three angels' messages. Now, with that being said, we are held to a higher standard and accountability to God. But let me tell you something. Let's say you are in the world and you hear about these Adventists that have the last message that God's people need before Jesus returns. They have the most solemn message ever to be given to the world, and then you go to visit the church, and it's nothing like what you expect. And you scratch your head saying, this is the people that hold the most solemn message, and they don't even act like they believe it? What is that going to do to your faith? This is why God does not now work to bring many into the truth, because our lives contradict our message. God's saying, once you live the message that I'm asking you to preach, then you will be safe to bless. Amen? Then we will see souls coming in like never before. Then we will see thousands upon thousands entering the truth, entering the church. You know, I go door to door sometimes, and I knock on doors, and I talk to a lot of different people. Amen? One time I was in Arizona, and I was going around, and I knocked on a door. I met a guy named Gerhard, and Gerhard scared the life out of me. Because it was a a very cloudy day, it was starting to get dark, the weather was bad, and I'm out and I'm knocking on doors, and we're in the middle of nowhere in Arizona. (laughs) Like literally in the middle of nowhere. We're in this little abandoned neighborhood, and it's like far from each house to the next. Like you got to walk pretty far. You better get two bottles of water just for the walk to the next house. So I knock on this door, and this guy, Gerhard, I knock, and there's no answer at the door. But this guy quickly runs around the corner, and he's got a screwdriver in his hand, and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm thinking this guy's about to stab me with the screwdriver or something, and I'm like, whoa, hold on. (laughs) So I show him this DVD, and I I, I passed him a DVD. It's called The Odyssey. The Odyssey goes over the origin of evil, the war in heaven, the fall of Lucifer, why the world is the way it is, good God, bad world. It explains a lot of these questions, right? And I'm explaining what the DVD is about to him. And he says, I already know the answer to that. Let me ask you a question. I'm like, all right. Well, what's your question? He says, do you believe that a man must be converted to enter the, he- the kingdom of heaven? I said, well, yes, I do believe that. He says, how come churches don't teach that anymore? How come they teach that all we have to do is come to Christ and say a little prayer and we're saved? And it doesn't matter how we live after that. This guy's not even Adventist. And I said to him, you know, you're absolutely right. I believe that a man must be born again, but I do not believe that the born again experience is a one-time experience. It's a daily experience. Every day when I wake up, I have to be born again. Amen? And Gerhard looked at me and he says, amen. And then he says, I have another question for you. Do you believe that persecution will come to America? I say, yes, sir, I do. He says, how come it's not happening here, but it's happening in other parts of the world? I said, because they're living like Christ and we're not, if you want a simple answer. And he said, amen. And he says, why is it that churches don't teach this anymore? I said, actually, there is a church that teaches this. It's called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You should come. And he says, wait, 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 wait. Seventh-day Adventist Church. He says, hold on. I listened to a guy from that church. He's a bull guy that used to live in a cave. I say, yeah, Doug Batchelor. Yeah, I love that guy. He goes, I watch him on 3ABN every day. Amen. This guy's not Adventist, but he knows our message. Amen. And you know what he said to me? He looked at me and he says, I've never stepped foot in an Adventist church. I don't go to an Adventist church. He said, I listen to everything you guys teach, and I agree 100% with the message. He says, the one thing I have not come to understand yet is why... Do you put so much emphasis on the Sabbath? I said, brother, let me just tell you something. If you're studying the way you're studying and you're seeing the way end time events are lining up, God is going to reveal to you the significance of the Sabbath in connection with end time events. Keep studying. And I left him with that and walked off. Never saw him again. Don't know where he's at today. He's probably still not a part of the Adventist church, but he believes our message. And you'll be surprised how many times I bump into people that know our message better than we do as Adventists. 
but are not a part of the Adventist church. Why? Because if they came in, we would corrupt them. That's the truth. I know this truth is a little cutting to some people, but that's the reality. This is what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy says. You see, at the time, in the time of the Jews, God had a remnant then. Amen? The Jews were his people. And he gave them a gospel. He gave them a special message to share with the world. But when you read Desire of Ages, chapter 3, she says that the heart of the heathen people was longing for a religion that would touch the heart. They were longing for something more. But when they went to Israel, when they went to the chosen people of God, they said, this can't be it. These people aren't even living like the message says they should. Friends, we need to ask ourselves, what do people get when they come and visit our church? Do they see the truth not only preached, but do they see it in our lives? She goes on to say in pastoral ministry, pastoral ministry, page 101, paragraph 2. This is a very important statement. Please take this one down. The success of a church, the what? What is success? You know, we may look at success very differently in a worldly sense than God looks at it in a church. But what is the purpose of the church? We are to reach the world around us. Amen? So success will be winning souls to Christ. Amen? Getting baptisms, and not getting baptisms just to have numbers on a piece of paper either. Getting baptisms that will last. People that will stay in and stand for the truth in the end. Amen? Not just rushing them through the baptismal pool so we could get numbers. Pastoral ministry, page 101. The success of a church does not depend on the efforts and labor of the living preacher. Wow, wait a minute. You see, we oftentimes look, if an event is unsuccessful, we need to work harder next year. We need to do more. We need to hand out more flyers. We need to get the word out even more. Let me tell you, we're beginning at the wrong place. If souls are not being won by the events we're holding, maybe it's something in our hearts that's keeping people from coming. The success of a church does not depend upon the efforts and labor of the living preacher, but it depends upon the piety. The what? The piety of the individual members. God blesses a likeness to his son's character more than he blesses our labors. Although we should be laboring for him, amen, don't get me wrong. But if we're laboring and we're not reflecting the character of Christ, we're laboring in vain. She says it depends upon the piety of individual members. Now, what is piety? What is piety? This was written by Alan White back in the 1800s. So I looked up the word piety in the uh, Noah Webster's Dictionary of 1828. It's from our time era. It should give us a good definition of what she meant, right? She says here, or they say in in, uh, Webster's Dictionary 1828 edition, Piety equals reverence to the supreme being and love for his character. Reverence to the supreme being and love of his character. Amen? She says, piety in practice is the exercise of these affections in obedience to his will and devotion to his service. So the question we need to ask, how obedient am I to the truth? And how devoted am I to his service? You know, you can really see the devotion of a church when we hold an outreach event and only three or four people show up. You know, we're we're good at talking to talk, but when it comes down to it, nobody wants to go out and knock on a door. Nobody wants to win souls for Christ. Why is that? Friends, I'm not trying to rebuke or to be harsh at all. I'm simply trying to wake us up to a deep reality that we need to have Christ abiding in the heart. Amen? Amen. And when Christ truly abides in the heart, we will not help but go out and give the message that we have. We will realize the beauty of our message. And guess what? When Christ is truly in the heart, as some people say, all we need to do is preach Christ is all about Christ. Well, if Christ is truly in the heart, we would not water down the message. We will realize the beauty of the message that Christ has given us. And we will preach the end time message, the three angels' messages, undiluted by our own opinions. Undiluted with the water and the wine of Babylon. Amen. 
actually the Apostles, page 9. She says, The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It's God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. Amen? If you ever forgot what your mission is, we are the agency through which God works to win souls to the truth, to be saved. Amen? We are to prepare a people to stand in the last days through the midst of the crisis. She says, it was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plans that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. The members of the church, those who he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. We are to show the world the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It is character. We're to reflect the character of Jesus Christ to the world. Amen? Now, we read in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 370. You remember what the quote says? The Lord is not now working to bring many into the truth because of those who have never been converted or those who once were converted but are backslidden. Right? Now, we just read in Acts of the Apostles that the church is organized for service. Our mission is to win souls to Christ, but God is not working with us to bring souls in because there needs to be a change of heart. Now, if God's not working, let me ask this. What is the purpose of church finances? For service, to help those in need, to pay those who go out and do the work of winning souls. Amen? To take care of those in need, to do a work of benevolence, to take care, basically, the finances are for us to do the service and the will of God. Amen? But now let me ask you something. If God is not now working to bring many souls into the truth, which is the whole purpose of the church, why would he work to bring finances into the church, which are for the purpose of winning souls? Sometimes we question, when we see that we're behind and finances are different things, we start questioning, well, what can we do to cause people to give more? We're starting at the wrong place. The question should be, what can we do to revive the hearts of our people? Amen? Amen. Sometimes God allows it to be reflected in our wallets because that's where it hurts us. But the truth is, we need revival. And when we have revival, when we have a hard consecration to God, everything else will come as a result. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen? When we put Christ first, he will take care of all the other issues that we're looking at. And many times we get distracted by the issues. Oh, we don't have enough money for this. We don't have enough for that. Oh, we don't have this. We don't have that. Those are all distractions to take us away from the heart issue. The title of today's message is A Work of the Heart. Amen? God will not bless a church with baptisms. God will not bless a church with finances. Unless we show God that we are safe to bless. Amen? It's not that God does not want to bless us. It's just that we need to prove ourselves safe to bless. Amen? God cannot bestow all his blessings and open the windows of heaven on a church that are going to misuse his gifts. But when when our hearts, when it's in our hearts to do God's will and God's will only and not put our will before his will, he says, those are people who I could bless. Because they're willing to go even to the grave for me. They're willing to put me first, last, and everything. And that's the kind of people that I need. Amen? That's the kind of people that will finish the work. Jump with me over to uh, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15. We're going to keep the message relatively short. I'm going to try not to go too much longer here. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15. I want you to notice something with me here. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. What does the word of God tell us here? In the words of Christ himself, it says, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And should understand with what? Understand with the heart and should be converted. Notice, it's when we understand with the heart that conversion takes place. You see, we do a good job of understanding intellectually. We understand with our head, but it takes an understanding of the heart to be converted. Amen? It says, 
lest they should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. When conversion takes place, healing takes place. God will heal all the issues in the church when his people are converted. But what does it take first? What is the first step? We need to understand with more than just the head, we need to understand with the heart. Amen? Now, keep this in mind as we turn to Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5. You know, the other day I saw this connection and I was really astonished by this. It makes so much sense. And it amazes me how simple it really is. You see, when we understand with the heart, the heart will be converted and God will heal us. But notice this. We're going to Isaiah 1 and verse 5. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. Notice, the whole head is sick, but the heart's faint. Let me ask you something. What happens when you overeat and you eat more than your body is able to digest? You get sick, right? This might have happened to some of you during Thanksgiving. I hope not because we're told to be temperate. (laughs) But some of you might have experienced this. But see, the truth is when we eat more than we can actually digest, it makes us sick. We can get sick by being intemperate, by taking too much. Now it says the whole head is sick. Why? Because we've crammed the intellect full of information. We fed the mind, but the heart is faint. What does it mean to be faint? To be weak. The mind is, over, the mind is sick because it's overstuffed with information. While the heart is starving for food. You understand what I'm saying? You see, we have so much information. We have all kinds of prophecy. We have all kinds of information. But unless the truth is making it past the intellect and into the heart, it's all in vain. You see, we've come to a time, friends... When it's more than just believing what we believe, we need, we need more than simple, a simple intellectual understanding of the truth. Amen? We need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe what we believe. We need to know where it's found and how to prove it. But not only that, we need to have a love for the truth. And who is the truth? Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. We need more than just an understanding of the truth. We need a love for the truth. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. And as we're turning there, let me just say this briefly. What is coming up in just two weeks from now? Walk through Bethlehem, amen? How many of you are excited about walk through Bethlehem? I'm excited, amen? How many of you are... Well, I'm not going to ask that question. (laughs) Yeah, we'll leave it at that. How many of us are excited about walk through Bethlehem? Now, some of us are going to volunteer. Some of us are going to do what we can to help. And from the bottom of my heart, sincerely, I say thank you. If you're able to help. If you don't, we understand. Amen? But for those of you who are going to help and do your part, we thank you very much. We need the help. Amen? But could I just say something from the heart today? Could I share with you something? You know the best thing you could do to help win more souls through Walk Through Bethlehem or any event that we hold here? Is to get on your knees and say, Lord, search my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. And remove it from me. Take away anything that stands between my heart and your soul. Between my soul and my Savior. Take away anything. That's between me. And as we do that, as we experience true revival, as we experience a true heart transformation, the work we do will bring forth 10 or even 100 full results of what it was. You know, this year we could win more souls to Christ through this event if we only search our hearts and give everything to God. And I'm just going to ask those of you who are volunteer, please take this to God in prayer and say, Lord, Reveal to me what's in my heart. 
And remove those things from my life that are not in harmony with your word, that you may be able to bless me, and not only me, but bless us corporately as a church. That we may win more souls to the truth. That we may be an example, not only of what we preach, but what we believe, that it may be reflected in our lives. Amen? Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and them that perish, because they receive not what? The love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. It's not enough to simply believe the truth. If we don't have a love for the truth, God will send a delusion that we will be lost, that we will believe in a lie, that we will be set apart. Friends, we need to get to the point where we fall in love with the truth of God. Our prayer should be, Lord, don't only teach me the truth, give me a love for your truth. Give me a a love so deep that I'm willing to stand even in the midst of opposition for your truth. Amen? Amen. We need to get to that point where the love of truth is more important to us than anything else. Amen. I want to read a quote from Steps to Christ, page 78.2. She says, So those who are partakers of the grace of Christ will be ready to make any sacrifice that others for whom he died may share in the heavenly gift. They will do all that they can to make the world better for their, for their stay in it. This spirit is the sure outgrowth of a soul truly converted. You want evidence that you're truly converted? When it is in your heart to help others, that is a sign that you've truly been converted. When you put others before your own desires, that is a sign that God has converted your heart. Amen? She says this, No sooner, no sooner than does one come to Christ There is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. When the heart is truly converted, the truth cannot be shut up in the heart. You will want to preach the truth. As Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter, what was it? Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9. He says, your word is as a fire in my bones. I cannot hold it back. Friends, when we are truly converted, we will speak those same words as did Jeremiah. We will not be able to sit still. We have to tell somebody about the truth. Amen? And as I mentioned before, we will not water down that truth or add our own words to that truth. We will speak the truth unmixed, undiluted. Amen? Manuscript 152, 1897. Brethren and sisters, God calls upon you, both ministers and laypersons. Who are the laypersons? That's us, amen? Both ministers and laypersons. Listen to his voice as speaking to you through his word. Let his truth be received into your heart, not just into the mind, but into the heart, amen? Let his truth be received into your heart that you may be spiritualized by his living, sanctifying power. Then let the distinct message for this time be sent from watchman to watchman on the walls of Zion. You see, we can go and spread the message, but the truth is if we're spreading the message before the heart has been converted, then it's a dead message falling upon dead ears. But friends, when we have had an experience with Christ, when the heart has been converted and touched by the love of God, then that message will go forth and it will do its appointed work. It will wake up people who are sincere and who are looking for the truth, and they'll say, whoa, we are living in a serious time. I better get my life together. And hearts will begin to surrender to God. But it begins with the messenger first. We need a heart transformation that we may be able to touch the hearts of others. How can we tell someone else about how Christ can transform their life if our life has not first been transformed? You know... I'll use myself for this illustration. I'm a skinny guy. (laughs) I'm not blessed with a lot of muscle. Imagine if I came up here and I was like, yeah, I want to tell you about this uh, this workout program that will get you shredded in 30 days. You're going to look at me and be like, well, it ain't working for you. (laughs) 
You see, people are looking at us, friends. And the message we preach, they want to see it lived throughout our lives. We need to be an example of what the truth can do. And when people see that in our lives, they will be more inclined to accept what, what is coming from our mouths. But we can't give them a message that has not touched us first. Amen. Steps to Christ, page 43, and we'll end with this. The whole heart, how much? The whole heart must be yielded to God, or the change can never be wrought in us, by which we are to be restored into his likeness. By nature, we are alienated from God. The Holy Spirit describes our condition in such words as these. We are dead in trespasses and sins. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. No soundness is in it. We are held fast in the sneer of Satan, taken captive by him at his will. God desires to heal us, amen? To set us free. But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of the whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to him. The warfare against self is the greatest battle ever fought. Your greatest battle is not even against Satan. It's against you because Satan works through your unregenerate heart to bring about those temptations. Amen. Our greatest battle is surrendering the heart and the will to God to the point where we say, I love you more than I love myself, so I'm willing to do your will rather than my own. Lord, I really want to do this, but you said to do this, so I'm going to do what you said because you know best. Amen. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. Amen. The heart must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. Friends, it takes a struggle to put God's will before us. It takes a struggle to surrender the heart to God. But the hardest part of the Christian walk is our own stubborn nature. The thing that makes the whole walk difficult is the fact that we are so unwilling to simply surrender to God and let him do the work in us. Now, when God comes in and he begins to do that work, we still have to work in cooperation with him. Amen. We need to work on the work of cooperation. That's biblical. That's all throughout the spirit of prophecy. Men and God must work hand in hand together in the work of overcoming sin and being restored into the likeness of God's character. Amen. But it begins with a heart surrender. Many of us are struggling harder than we need to because we have not first given our heart fully to God. And when we give our heart fully to God, we will not withhold anything. We'll say, Lord, do you want me to give up my house for you? Should I give up my car? What else do you want me to give for you, Lord? It will no longer be a struggle. We will be willing to lay all on the altar of sacrifice for our Lord and Savior. And the time is coming. The time is now, matter of fact, where we need to have everything on that altar. Because if we're putting anything before Christ, that will come up against us in a time of trouble and will crush us. We're living in a time where very soon we're going to have to flee. We're going to have to put everything before us and, and trust God to lead us every step of the way, to provide for us every step of the way. And if we cannot learn to give him all that we have now and say, Lord, take my heart and provide for me, how will we make it through that final crisis? Friends, there needs to be a full, heartfelt surrender. There needs to be nothing between our soul and our Savior. You know, if you can honestly look at your heart today and you say, Lord, there's still things that I'm holding on to. There's still something between me and you that's not fully right. And I know, Lord, I've been struggling with it. I've been wanting to give it up, but it's so hard. God understands that it's difficult. He sent his son in the likeness of human flesh. He struggled with the same things we do. God understands, but he doesn't make excuses for it either. He says, I understand that it's a struggle, but give it up because I'm only going to replace it with something better. And when we give our hearts to God, what are we really giving up? Esteem with sin anyway. Why don't we give God our hearts fully today? If you're looking in and you say, Lord, there's things between me and you that aren't right. Lord, I want a full surrender. I want the Holy Spirit to come in and make a full transformation in my heart today. If that's you, I'm going to ask that you stand with me right where you are. Maybe you're looking and you say, Lord, I've never been converted. Or maybe you're saying, Lord, I was once converted, but I backslid. I'm going to ask that you stand with us as well as we have a word of prayer. 
Father in heaven, Lord, we, we thank you for another Sabbath day. We thank you for bringing us safely here to hear your word. And Father, we realize the need of a transformation of heart, a transformation of character, Father. Lord, we need to begin with a work of the heart. Many of us have reformed our lives. We've changed the way we dress. We've changed the way that we eat, the way we talk, the way we do things, Lord. But the question that remains is, has our heart truly changed? Lord, we need a transformation that only you can do in us. And Lord, we surrender to you today. We ask that you do that work in us. Lord, make us a church. Make us a people that are safe to bless. That you may pour out abundantly upon our souls, Lord. Souls for your kingdom. Father, may we be a perfect reflection of what we should be in these last days. May we reflect the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Bless us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing as we have our hymn of adoration, our, our hymn of consecration, rather. Please grab your hymnal. It will be 309, I Surrender All. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. If you grab your hymnal in front of you, we'll be singing 309. Shall we receive the benediction? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God and Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We have a very short announcement and then you will be dismissed by rules. Just one item of church business today we need to uh, take care of. We have a transfer out. It's the second reading. So we need to have a motion for James Steverson to Southside SDA Church. Do I have a motion for that? And a second? Thank you. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Now we shouldn't be in favor of somebody moving out. But we'll take it. The deacons will assist you out. May you have a blessed day. <laughs>